I wonder what picture might come into your mind uh, if you hear the word holy. And you think of a, a monk uh, sheltered away in a monastery somewhere doing holy things like copying the Bible. Uh, a nun, uh, Mother Teresa perhaps, giving up her comfortable life uh, to serve others. Uh, some sort of special super Christian Uh, who uh, floats through life untouched by the temptations that we face. Uh, When you hear the word holy, maybe you imagine a list of rules uh, and restrictions. Don't do that. Don't go there. If you do, you'll never really be clean again. Uh, Does the word holy suggest some kind of a burden that is hard to bear? If we think of holiness, uh, do we think, oh, it's the opposite of grace. Holy is not gospel. Holy means insensitive, impractical, uh, a burden. Uh, Would it be good for someone to describe you or me as a holy person? Well, Jesus says that it is Uh, here in Uh, This letter to the church in Thyatira, holiness is the thing he's looking for. Uh, And he calls them to be holy because they are his. And we see the same message to us in lots of other places in the Bible. Think of 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, where we're told that uh, we are to be holy because God is holy. Uh, because he's the one who's called us uh, to follow him. Uh, To be holy means to say no to what God is not and yes to being like God is. Uh, To put it in a sentence, to be holy is to be like Jesus, Uh, not a, a list of burdensome restrictions but a description of a whole and full and good life, the life that Jesus has lived. Uh, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11 that he's come uh, not to lay a heavy burden on us, but he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, And so my uh, aim today uh, as we come to these verses in uh, Revelation chapter 2, is that we would see how to grow useful and holy in Jesus. And that's our little summary uh, sentence for today. You might like to say it to help it to, to stick. Grow useful and holy in Jesus. Come with me as we see these ideas of usefulness, Uh, and of holiness uh, that are ours in in Jesus. First of all, uh, we see Jesus uh, is writing to a church that is better than it was at first uh, in verses 18 and 19. Uh, He says to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Try imagining this picture that Jesus is sending to this church of the Saviour who has died for them, uh, who lives again, uh, that John described in chapter 1, walking among the lampstands that represent the church. And now not only is he among these group of churches, but his blazing eyes fix upon this congregation uh, in the little town of Thyatira. And he knows their hearts and their minds. He knows what they really think. He knows what this church really loves. And his glowing feet of bronze means he will stand for what is good and right and holy and he can trample into the dust all that is evil. What would this Jesus say to 
to us as a church? Would he say what he says in verse 19? I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are doing more than you did at first. What a wonderful thing for Jesus to say. Uh, We'd love, wouldn't we, to be known uh, by everyone as a church that is active and welcoming and spiritual, caring, Uh, a church that perseveres, knowing what we're here for, sticking at it. And if Jesus says that that is what we really are, we would be happy as a church, wouldn't we? It takes effort, endurance, uh, hard work. Uh, Love always costs because it's sacrificial. Uh, Exercising faith means living when we don't always see what we're aiming for. Uh, Serving, well, that always humbles us. Persevering takes strength and purpose and motivation. And Jesus comes and says, church, you're doing all this. And in fact, doing more than you did it at first. If you look at the end of verse 19. uh, When, uh, I don't know about you, but when uh, I get interested in something new, I've got a lot of interested enthusiasm in it. Uh, But these believers, they don't slacken off as the years go by. Uh, They don't just keep up the pace of when they were new Christians. Uh, They build more and more. As time goes past, they're they're doing more than they did at first. Uh, As an elder and a pastor, this is so encouraging to see uh, among God's people. When we realise that to be a Christian doesn't just mean we will be served by the church, but that we serve as part of the church, that we don't just come to have interesting messages and engaging Bible studies served up to us, but that our pastors and teachers are here to equip us to serve, to do the work God has saved us to do. It's so encouraging to see that amongst you and in in so many of you. And I wonder how we would feel then if if these words in verse 19 were addressed to us. If Jesus said to the angel of the church in Benalla, write, I know your deeds, your love, your faith, your service and perseverance. I know you're doing more than you did at first. I wonder what would be need to be different about us for that to be true. Are there ways that we've slackened off uh, or given up on what it means to be Jesus' people? Are there ways Jesus is calling us to keep going, keep persevering, keep serving, keep loving? to be equipped to do more for him. See, Jesus here, I think, expects us to be discontent with what we are as God's people, that we should be growing, we should be uh, being equipped to serve him in the strength he gives. Now, what can we do then as a church uh, to be doing better than we were at first. What are the things we need to remember? What do we? What are the good things for us to keep building on? What are the new things to learn or the ways we need to change what we have done? Here is a church that is doing better than it did at first. But that's not the only thing Jesus knows about this church. They are ignoring a great danger, uh, the danger of tolerance. And this is the second thing Jesus says to the church at Thyatira, you tolerate 
Jezebel. Look at verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. A church that has so much going for it also faces great danger. Uh, Yes, in other letters, Jesus warns churches against persecution that is coming. But as we saw with the church at Smyrna that was going to be persecuted for a time, persecution never destroys the church. But tolerating sin does. We need to be clear, don't we? It's not a sin to tolerate differences. We are all different. It's not a sin to have different personalities, to have differences of opinion in the church, different ways that we do things. That's not what Jesus is addressing here. But it is a sin when we tolerate sin, Uh, when we... Uh, we shouldn't have a problem with people who have different ideas and different preferences to us. But we cannot ignore people crossing the line that God draws, that God lays down. That is the tolerance Jesus corrects here. Notice uh, the kind of sin and the, the the embodiment of it here, uh, who the sin is coming from in verse 20. Uh, Jesus calls uh, this woman Jezebel. Uh, Might have been her real name. I suspect it's probably meant to point us back to 1 Kings 21 that we read earlier, uh, showing how much she is like uh, the princess from Sidon who marries King Ahab and leads him astray, who introduces the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth to Israel. And as Kathy read to us in verses 25 and 26 of 1 Kings 21, there was never anyone like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, urged on by Jezebel, his wife. Jesus says that this church has someone doing the same thing among them. And so he calls her Jezebel. Now, you might have heard people use this uh, in church today. Uh, There are, are some Christians who take this verse and they are very willing to label people as having the spirit of Jezebel. Uh, it becomes a very convenient accusation, particularly against a woman uh, who disagrees, uh, especially uh, when it's a leader who wields this label. And, of course, uh, the more that you say, no, that's not me, that's not me, I'm not like that, the more it seems to prove that you're disagreeable. But Jesus isn't using this name Jezebel just to write someone off. He makes three clear claims here. There are three things this woman does that shows that she is like Jezebel. Uh, And I'm sure that the moment the messenger started reading verse 20, everyone in church went, (gasps) you mean he's going to go there? They would have known who this was. Uh, This Jezebel is self-proclaimed, self-taught, and self-serving. She is self-proclaimed to be a prophet. She is a self-taught teacher. She is self-serving in her compromise. Look at verse 20. She was a self-proclaimed prophet. She calls herself a prophet, long before anyone else did. Here is someone who stands up in church and says, I've got God's word for you, or who pulls someone aside afterwards and says, oh, God told me to tell you, because obviously he lost your address. 
And so he needed me to communicate his will for you about something his word is silent about. Beware of people who set themselves up thinking they have God's will for you beyond what his word says. She was self-proclaimed. She was a self-taught teacher. Notice in verse 20, by her teaching, she misleads Jesus' servants. Here is someone teaching not Jesus' teaching, not the apostles' teaching, not the Bible's teaching, someone teaching their own opinions, their own ideas, and passes them off as God's word. And if we listen to self-appointed, self-taught teachers, we will very quickly be led astray off the narrow path that Jesus teaches. And the results will be the same as we find here. As she was a self-serving compromiser. Notice by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of foods sacrificed to idols. Here we find the real agenda. Uh, Not godliness, not faithfulness, not holiness. Now, here's someone who's found a way to compromise, a way to fit in, a way to be like the world rather than being holy like Jesus. Just like the original Jezebel, uh, she teaches that uh, you can go along to the celebrations at the local temple. After all, that's what a good citizen would do. You want to be seen on Australia Day and Anzac Day and all of the the big celebrations. (coughs) And wouldn't you go along to the party afterward? And maybe she could even say, (coughs) and don't worry if you get carried away, God will forgive you in the end, won't he? See, worshipping idols and unrestricted sexuality often go together. It was true then, it's true now. We might not have little stone or wooden statues in the corner of our house, but the same attitude of idol worship can be in our hearts too. Uh, When we see God as someone who will give us good things if we do the right thing, we've reduced him into an idol. And it'll be very easy to think, well, he only sees the bits of life I want him to see. I'll come and present something good when I'm ready and pull the lever and good things will come, but what I don't want to see, I'll hide And we hear the same voice, the same Jezebel voice today, don't we? Oh, what do you mean you're not coming along? Do you think you're better than us? Oh, go on. You can fit in. Maybe they'll want to follow you sometime. But Jesus says that this is immorality. This is living outside of the lines that God has drawn for our good. Living how we want, not how God calls us. And Jesus says this is a problem for the church. Jesus hasn't just sent this letter, oh, by the way, John, while the messenger goes past Thyatira, drop this in Jezebel's letterbox. Notice what he says in verse 21. I have this against you as a church, that you tolerate this. That's why he names names, because this sin spreads. And in this open letter, he calls the whole church to deal with this sin. 
Now, we would not dare to accuse Jesus of doing the wrong thing, would we? Oh, our church is too loving to do that. Think how the poor lady would have felt. How embarrassing. But here in the unchanging word of God, From nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus exposes the sin that was undermining and infecting his church. They had failed to act, and so Jesus steps in. Her sisters and brothers had not taken her aside privately. The elders had not called her to repent. And so Jesus does. Notice in verse 21, this isn't even the first time. Jesus says, I have given her time to repent of her immorality. But she is unwilling. He's patient. Doesn't judge people hastily. But when we refuse to repent, he acts fairly. And justly, he says, I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. And I will strike her children dead. Jesus judges Jezebel. There's been time she refuses to change her mind and her actions. How we should pray, friends, that we will not be so entangled by sin, that we would rather live in it and receive its consequences than receive the grace of Jesus. Why would we suffer when we could be forgiven? Jesus judges those who follow her. Uh, who join in with this sin. How short-sighted we are when we follow other Christians. Are they getting away with it? I will too. How foolish we are. And see, Jesus judges her children. That could be her actual children, That's a totally reasonable way to read it. Uh, We know, don't we, how good a godly mother is to influence her children for the Lord. And the same is true the opposite way. An ungodly woman can do so much damage, leading her children astray, poisoning their minds, distorting their consciences, encouraging them when they do the wrong thing. Just as an ungodly father can do. Children who join their parents' sins are accountable themselves. Or it could be an echo of what we read in 1 Kings 21, 21, that God was going to wipe out all of Ahab's family from the people of Israel to make sure there would be no successes to Jezebel that her influence would end with her. That may be what Jesus is doing here in the church at Thyatira, saying there will be no one to pick up her mantle and keep teaching what she's done. But either way, the judgment of Jesus is fair. It's just, it's patient. And he will bring an end to unrepentant ungodliness. Notice the reason why. Not out of unrestrained rage. Look at the end of verse 23. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Jesus wants all churches, all of his followers, he wants us today to know he sees what our hearts beat for. 
He knows what our minds are full of, what they go back to all the time. We can mask ourselves and fool others, but before his blazing eyes, the mask melts away. And he repays according to what we do. And this doesn't mean a Christian can become unsaved. But our reward matches up with the usefulness of our life here on earth. Friends, Jesus' blazing eyes see our hearts, that he knows our minds. Are our hearts committed to being holy for him? Or are we just trying not to get caught? What will it look like for us then? Uh, If we are to live for Jesus, if we're to turn away from tolerating sin, what will it look like if we fight what is wrong, what is false, what is evil? Well, in verses 24 to 29, Jesus says, hold on to him. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, who, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Jesus gives us a little sample of this Jezebel's teaching here. She's offering deep secrets, something more. But they're not God's secrets, they're Satan's. Paul writes in 1 Timothy chapter 4 about people abandoning the faith to follow deceiving spirits, things that are actually taught by demons. And notice the lure that is attached to this false teaching. Uh, It draws many Christians away. Uh, The thought that there is something more than the gospel. There is something more spiritual for us to discover, something deeper, something that the rest of of most of the other Christians just don't understand some second blessing from the Holy Spirit, some higher experience of God's pleasure and presence. And maybe we might think to ourselves, well, we just keep on hearing that same old simple message that Jesus has died for our sins and when we trust him, we're forgiven and we live forever. And after a few decades, it gets a bit Boring, doesn't it? Shouldn't there be more? Or we say, well, I've been a Christian a while, but I want to find something more spiritual, something more challenging. Isn't there more? Uh, all, yeah, of course, new believers, they need the gospel, but I am into, into all this high-tech doctrine. I'm, I'm so interested in church history and apologetics and philosophy. I'm into church history and philosophy and doctrine and apologetics. They're good things. But we never move beyond the gospel. We never move beyond the good news that Jesus is what we need. And we need to be reminded every day of that. Uh, We need each other to remind us at church that Jesus is what we need this week. We need to remind each other as we open the Bible, as we pray, as we go into the day, today what I need is Jesus. It's his grace that saves us and that makes us holy, as we saw in Titus chapter 2. 11 to 14. It's his grace that saves us, that helps us to live for him. It's his grace that rescues us, that presses us on towards the goal with endurance so that we fix our eyes on the one who began and who finishes our faith. Not something deeper, 
something hidden from all the other regular Christians. That he gave himself for us. That's what we hold on to. That's what the people at Thyatira already have. And what Jesus says they are to hold on to until he comes. And see the blessings that come from that. He says he'll give authority over the nations and he'll give the morning star. Uh, He quotes from Psalm chapter 2, a prophecy about Jesus exercising authority over the world, shattering with a rod of iron all who will not bow before him. And here Jesus says, when you bow before him, you will share his authority over the world, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden. Brothers and sisters, that is the authority he sends us in to make disciples, to go to the nations and call them to bow their knee and confess with their mouth, Jesus is Lord. And he promises us with that, the morning star. Our friends of ours have on the wall in their house a, a map of the sky with a, a star that has been marked on it, named for one of their children. Uh, this star, the, the morning star, is named in, in Jesus' day and in our day after a god, after Venus, uh, the god of victory. And Jesus says, no. I give you that star. I give you the God who is victorious. I give you the one who has conquered every enemy. In Numbers 24, 17, there's a prophecy of a coming king and saviour who is a rising star. This is Jesus himself promising he will give us his victory, he will give us himself. And so as verse 29 says, if your ears aren't painted on today, hear his promises. You can do more than you did at first. You can say no, even when sin is in the church, and he will give you himself. Hold on to Jesus Because he is all that you need. There's a lot here in this letter to the church at Thyatira that confronts them and that confronts us. But ultimately, we don't need something deeper. We don't need something more. We need Jesus in the gospel to hold on to him. That's how we'll grow useful in his service. That's how we'll grow holy in living for him. As we hold on to what we already have until Jesus comes. Well, let me pray for us. We would know his help to do that. Let's pray. Our wonderful Lord and Saviour Jesus, uh, every knee will bow before you one day. Uh, Every tongue that has ever spoken a word will confess that you are Lord. And today we praise you because you are the Saviour who searches hearts and minds, who stands in victory over all that is evil and even exposes it in your church. Our God, we want to be people, we want to be a church that does more than we did at first. We want to be useful for you. And here you say in the end, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. So help us call for repentance where that's necessary among your people, lovingly, just as we would want it to be done to us. 
Uh, Help us not to try and move on beyond your good news, but to hold on to Jesus, to hold on to your grace, to know that if we uh, have come to your cross in repentance and faith, we're forgiven, and that all else that you call us to do and to be flows out of that grace that already saves us. So we pray that we would treasure the gifts you give and the rewards, like the morning star, ultimately showing that you have won the victory for us and give us yourself. So we pray in your wonderful and saving name, Lord Jesus. Amen.